What's the scariest predator under the ocean? The crocodile? <laughs> I don't think so. Loch Ness Monster? Please, it never existed. How about the Kronosaurus? Well, it is extinct, but you might be onto something. Let's take a look at what it'd be like if these creatures were still around today. First things first, what on earth was it? The Kronosaurus was a marine carnivore that lived in the cool, high-latitude Aromanga Sea. It covered vast areas of inland Australia between 90 and 120 million years ago, during the early Cretaceous period. Near-complete fossils of the creature were also found near Colombia, which is a country that has a noted connection to prehistoric reptiles and turtles. This fact makes it extremely possible that the monster I'm about to describe existed worldwide. You might have heard Saurus and thought, oh, it's a dinosaur. But these were actually reptiles. They were the largest member of the Pleosauroidea family, referred to as Pleosaurs. Fossil evidence suggests they weighed over 20,000 pounds and were roughly 30 feet in length. Just to put that in perspective, the longest crocodile ever measured was a saltwater crocodile by the name of Lolong from the Philippines. It was 20 feet in length and weighed just under 2,500 pounds. And that's still 10 feet shorter and incredibly lighter than the average Kronosaurus, making the crocodile seem like nothing more than a glorified goldfish in comparison. Despite its terrifying length, the most physically daunting feature of the Kronosaurus was its head. Its skull was about 8 feet long, which was actually proportionally large given the size of its body length. Anything that was unfortunate enough to end up inside the Kronosaurus's mouth may have been given false hope. After all, the teeth of the beast weren't actually that sharp. On second thought, I take that back. I wouldn't feel confident around a toothless snake, let alone being inside the mouth of this monster. But it's true that the Kronosaurus's teeth weren't sharp, especially when compared to other carnivorous reptiles, such as crocodiles and alligators. The teeth of this prehistoric sea creature were instead conical. This means that they were cone-like in shape. Unfortunately, this lack of sharpness didn't make them less dangerous. The teeth were enormous and could be up to 12 inches long from the crown tips to the bottom of the roots. This obviously meant that the Kronosaurus had an extremely powerful bite. It was estimated to be up to 30,000 newtons, which is almost twice as powerful as the bite of a large saltwater crocodile. Because of the bluntness of their teeth, they weren't suited for twisting their prey once in their grasp. But the size and shape of the teeth made them perfect for simple open and shut biting. They would have had no problem crushing hard objects such as the toughest of shells any sea turtle could offer. Just like crocodiles, the Kronosaurus is believed to have had a short neck. This may have been an adaptation to allow the beast to successfully catch small evasive animals. Their body, in general, was fusiform and streamlined. This means it was narrowed at both ends and had very little resistance to the flow of water. The Kronosaurus was also equipped with four paddle-like limbs. The hind limbs were larger than the front ones. They could span approximately seven feet in diameter. All in all, this set the Kronosaurus up to effortlessly propel itself through the waters and be an ultimate predator. Predator X, if you will? That's the name that was given to the fossil of a creature discovered near Svalbard, a Norwegian island group, in 2009. The fossil was identified as a 50-foot-long, 100,000-pound monster with a bite force of 33,000 pounds per square inch. This might be the highest bite force of any known animal. Although Predator X is yet to be classified as any specific type of animal, it was definitely a pleosaur, like the Kronosaurus. And even if it wasn't Predator X, the Kronosaurus was still most definitely a ferocious titan when it roamed Earth's oceans. The Kronosaurus actually got its name from the Greek mythological figure of Cronus, the father of Zeus. Cronus was viewed as a titan from a generation of super powerful beings. So what was it that the Kronosaurus, this terrifying monster, actually feasted on to satisfy its appetite? This creature was known to eat sea turtles, squid, and other larger marine reptiles of that time, such as elasmosaurids and ichthyosaurs. 
This suggests that if crocodiles existed in the realms of the Kronosaurus, they too might have turned into lunch for the beast. There's evidence from the fossil remains of the Kronosaurus that suggests that they also feasted on sharks, which I know is a disappointment to those of you who view that beast as the king of the ocean. Not when the Kronosaurus was around, my friend. In any case, grounding all kinds of food into small pieces to help digest them would have been difficult without small teeth. This explains the presence of rounded stones found in many of the remains of these sea creatures. Researchers believe these stones may have been swallowed to control buoyancy or to help process food. It's also entirely possible they were accidentally swallowed while feeding on other animals from the sea floor. As if the Kronosaurus even needed to be a meanie with its already existing power and size, there's also evidence to suggest that it indeed might have been. It turns out that after using all its impressive attributes to catch its dinner, the Kronosaurus first liked to play with its food, like a cat does with a mouse. I guess since the hunt was so easy for them, they needed to get their fun from somewhere else. Well, I think now you should have a good idea about these creatures. So let's ask ourselves what it would be like if they were still around today. And by the way, why aren't they? Well, the Kronosaurus was completely finished off by the same KT meteor that took out the dinosaurs 66 million years ago. But even before this catastrophic event, they were coming under increased pressure from an even bigger and more vicious family of carnivorous marine reptiles known as Mosasaurs. You can't always be a top dog, I guess, or rather, top marine reptile. But what if this never happened, and they were still roaming Earth? Well, this might be obvious, but can you imagine what kind of impact that would have on sea tourism? Based on the impact that famous movies about sharks and killer whales had, what do you think the presence of a Kronosaurus in the ocean would do to beaches? The very creature that would eat sharks and whales for breakfast? Beaches would certainly become a great place to go for a quiet walk because nobody else would even be there. And what about such activities as boating, surfing, and scuba diving? You think anyone would dare try them, knowing that this 30-foot beast could be lurking beneath them? Let's give humans some credit and assume most of them wouldn't. This would cripple the global sea tourism industry, which is responsible for earning roughly $143 billion every year. Just to make sure this shocking point hits home, the most expensive yacht to ever roam the ocean was called the History Supreme. Its master bedroom was believed to have a statue made of T-Rex's bone and a wall made of meteorite rocks, as well as a 24 karat gold panoramic wall aquarium. Anyway, this yacht was worth nearly $5 billion, meaning you could buy 38 of them with the money lost and potential damages to sea tourism caused by the Kronosaurus. I'm sure that the yacht's owner was happy the beast never made an appearance in their luxurious aquarium. So luxurious, in fact, that some people believe the History Supreme, reportedly owned by some business genius from Malaysia, never even existed. Rumor has it that it was simply an elaborate hoax fabricated by the supposed designer. Anyway, I don't think the trouble would just stop there. People could actually be in serious danger, regardless of being near the ocean or not. No, I'm not about to tell you that this thing would grow legs, adapt to living on land, and start picking us off one by one. At least, I hope not. I'm just going to point out the damage that the Kronosaurus would inflict through its devastating impact on sea trade. In America, ocean transit accounts for 76% of national trade. On top of this, more than 100 vital pharmaceutical products originate in the sea. I'll also state the obvious and point out that the ocean is a huge food source for us humans. The presence of the Kronosaurus could have a great impact on our relationship with the ocean, something we usually take for granted. The giant shark that terrorized the oceans some 20 million years ago. For 13 million years, this 60-ton beast dominated the warm waters of our planet. Though, some believe that the Meg still lives in the most remote and deepest parts of the ocean. It's a hot summer day. It seems only logical to go for a swim in the sea. You're floating on your back, completely relaxed. Your eyes are closed. Your breath is even. Water's pleasantly cool around your body. A light breeze touches your face. You feel calm enough to doze off. 
Suddenly, something bumps into your leg. Yanked out of your half slumber, you begin to flail until you're face to face with the invisible danger. Luckily, all you spot is a couple of easily recognizable fins and cute smiley snouts. Phew, just dolphins. Guess you're lucky to meet them in the wild. These amazing creatures are so close, you can touch them. You've heard people say dolphins' skin feels rubbery, but to your mind, it's more like the inner part of a hard-boiled egg. One of the animals is so close to you that its salty smell fills your nostrils. You know, though, that dolphins don't have sweat glands. It means they don't sweat and are pretty much odorless. The smell you sense comes from the water they swim in. The largest and most ferocious predator to ever haunt the oceans, the megalodon shark dominated the seas for centuries before coming extinct millions of years ago. However, scientists managed to discover very few remnants of the giant shark. Everything we know about the great beast we've learned thanks to fossils of its giant teeth, which are just about the size of the average human hand. A megalodon skeleton has never been discovered. Shark skeletons are made mostly of cartilage, meaning that they decompose quickly. Luckily, sharks continuously shed and regrow teeth throughout their lives. One shark can go through 40,000 teeth in a single lifetime. Scientists have managed to study different types of shark species based on their teeth alone. The megalodon shark had around 276 teeth. When they fell out, those teeth landed in the seabed where they stayed for millions of years, fossilizing. Scientists found those teeth, and they're the only real record we have of the megalodon's existence. Megalodon teeth have been discovered all over the world. It means that unlike other marine animals of its time, the megalodon was intercontinental. Even today, most sharks and marine animals tend to stick to one sea or ocean. The megalodon shark swam freely around the world, moving between tropical and subtropical waters. Megalodon teeth have been found in every continent apart from the freezing cold waters of Antarctica. When a megalodon makes a starring appearance in a movie or TV show, it's portrayed to look like a giant version of a great white shark. Scientists previously believed that the megalodon and the great white shark both descended from one common ancestor. Still, it's not true. In fact, it's more likely that the megalodon was the arch enemy of the great white shark's ancestor, the broad-toothed mako shark. That means megalodon wouldn't have looked so similar to the great white after all. In reality, the megalodon would have a shorter nose than the great white, along with longer pectoral fins to give the giant shark a stockier and more threatening build. They both had an excellent sense of smell though. So even in prehistoric times, it wasn't a good idea to go swimming with a chunk of raw meat in hand. And it certainly isn't safe now. Whether the Meg's hiding somewhere in the depths, which some still believe is true, or it's gone forever, younger cousins will still be there waiting. Also, both of them like to go after big marine mammals, so they would certainly have things to do together. That is, until the Meg got moody and accidentally ate its friend. Eh, you never know. These guys had a different hunting style. Great whites prefer to dive straight towards their prey and find its softest spot, like exposed legs or underbelly. Sometimes, an entire tooth would be found embedded in a bone of some bigger animal, such as a whale. Without the main parts they use for swimming, poor sea animals were then helpless and unable to escape. Yet whales were just a smaller part of Megalodon's diet. Seals, sea cows, squids, dolphins, other sharks, the good old Meg probably wouldn't say no to some random school of smaller fish swimming into its mouth either. Nothing better than a good snack after a big tasty dinner. Even those giant turtles weren't safe with their thick shells. The Meg probably took them as a dare challenge on a daily basis. Scientists have used computer simulations to try and work out the hunting style of the ancient shark. Using this technology, scientists have discovered that the Megalodon's attack style was very different from that of modern-day sharks. Modern sharks dive straight for their prey's most vulnerable spot, for example, the soft underbelly of a seal. The megalodon's teeth were uniquely suited to biting through tougher areas of cartilage. So, evidence suggests that a megalodon would first chew the tougher fins of their prey, rendering them unable to swim away before launching into their final attack. Some people believe that the megalodon is still alive today, lurking at the depths of the ocean's waters. But it's unlikely to be true. Megalodons are a warm water species, which means they would be unable to survive in the cold waters of the deep ocean. 
most of the megalodon's potential prey live in shallower waters, meaning there would be very little for the megalodon to eat at deep sea level. Simply put, if there was an animal as big as the megalodon still living today, we would have spotted it by now. It is unlikely that you'll run into a meg though. The sharks, like us, preferred warm coastal waters. Deep ocean living would be too cold for the beasts and food would be scarce. Their entire bodies would also have to evolve to avoid being squished by the enormous water pressure down there. It's unlikely they're still around, but not impossible. Some good news if you do run into one is that the shark is pretty unlikely to eat you. You are way too small a meal for the megalodon, even if you have a couple of friends with you. This guy eats whales that are over 50 feet long. If you're having a beach party though, it's a different story. In a beach full of swimmers, the shark very well might creep up, scooping several humans into its giant mouth without even chewing. The fearsome name Megalodon comes from two Greek words, megas, meaning big, and odont, meaning tooth. Combined, they mean big tooth, and it certainly lives up to its name. Just one of its chompers is the same size as a human head. It had 276 humongous teeth in total, across five terrifying rows. In all of history, only a couple of saber-toothed cats and the T-Rex had consistently bigger teeth. Now that's a showdown I'd like to watch. The Megalodon vanished millions of years ago, leaving only huge teeth to be found by modern archaeologists. They literally disappeared with very few traces left. Scientists believe that over time, deep sea levels dropped and the ocean's temperature went down rapidly. Over a third of all marine life was wiped out as the oceans cooled and the number of animals at the bottom of the food chain plummeted. This had a catastrophic effect on the hungry predators at the top. Sorry guys. It became way too cold for these sun-loving sharks too, which made it difficult for them to reproduce since they gave birth in warm waters. The megalodon is usually described as a sort of great white shark, but this is just a common myth. In fact, the ancestors of today's great white existed at the same time as the meg, but they weren't best buddies and were even in competition with each other. The great white shark was a better hunter using its smaller size and agility to snap up the meg's prey quickly. They were also known to eat meg pups, who were only half their size. This didn't exactly help the whole extinction thing. While a great white was no match for an adult meg in a head-to-head -head fight, they sure weren't scared of stealing their food. This only left the bigger fish and whales for the meg, but its food supplies began to run out as whales swam to the cooler new seas. The whales adapted to prefer the colder temperatures, leaving our friend the meg behind. The megalodons either starved or were frozen into extinction by the ice age. Rather than a great white, the megalodon is more like a modern bull shark. It had a short snout, a flat lower jaw, and huge pectoral fins to support its massive weight and size. As scary as they are, these sharks were actually caring family guys. Several megalodon nursery areas have been discovered in Florida, Maryland, and Panama. They gave birth to their young in shallow water environments. We know this from discovering loads of tiny megalodon teeth found in these areas. I wonder if they had nannies too. In the past 30 years, scientists have made an incredible discovery of a new creature living deep beneath the surface of the ocean. And the name of the creature is the harp sponge. Now, if you're wondering why it took so long to come across this animal, then I might have the answer. These creatures typically hang out at a depth of roughly 11,100 feet beneath the ocean's waves. This sponge species was first discovered off the coast of California thanks to a robot that was sturdy enough to explore those crazy depths the ocean has to offer. This is no doubt an area of the planet where even the most benign-looking creatures can be potentially dangerous. But even scientists were surprised to find that this creature was more than just a sponge. Now, this might seem obvious, but the harp sponge got its name because its basic structure, referred to as a vein, is the same shape as a harp. Each vein is made up of a horizontal branch supporting several parallel vertical branches. But don't let the harp sponge's fanciful and amusing appearance or its non-intimidating name fool you. Yeah, the harp sponge is very much a deep-sea hunter. It has a unique ability to capture and envelop small animals using its rhizoids, short, thin fibers. 
With their help, the harp sponge clings on to the soft muddy bottom and catches tiny creatures that get swept into its branches by deep sea currents. Uh-oh. Other sponge creatures often feed by pulling bacteria and bits of organic matter from the seawater and filtering them through their bodies. But not our harp sponge. Mm-mm. Instead, it snatches its future meal with minuscule barbed hooks that cover each of the harp sponge's branches. Now, harp sponges prefer tiny crustaceans, like crabs, crayfish, shrimps, and prawns. Once the harp sponge has one of them in its clutches, it envelops the animal in a thin membrane before slowly beginning to digest it. So, pal, what's eating you? Oh, harpo? Too bad. Researchers believe that harp sponges use this method of feeding because there aren't enough nutrients that deep down. This makes traditional filter feeding less effective. Research has shown that the creature is still in the process of evolving. Early harp sponges researchers found only had two veins. But later, scientists discovered other harp sponges that had six veins. The harp sponge might have evolved this elaborate candle holder-like structure to increase its surface area. In general, harp sponges typically grow up to a length of one foot. But researchers have seen a creature that was two feet in length. The harp sponge is not only very unusual, but also beautiful to look at. See those tiny white balls on top of the branches? Now, why don't we look at some other creatures that live below the photic zone of Earth's oceans? The photic zone means the area beneath the ocean's surface that still receives some sunlight. Thanks to this, there are loads of different creatures and organisms living there. Any animal living beyond this layer qualifies as a deep-sea creature. The Tomopterus worm is a segmented worm you can find in the twilight zone of the ocean. This is the area that lies between 650 and 3,300 feet beneath the surface. These creatures are often no more than one inch long, but the largest of them can grow up to one foot. While swimming around and feeding, these worms do what researchers describe as an amazing smooth dance. That's because the creatures can swim extremely quickly and maneuver at tight angles with ease. Now, I know most people hear the word worm and think of the common earthworm. So it's quite interesting to know there's a deep sea worm out there that never leaves the water during its entire life. Similarly, most of us try to avoid jellyfish that either rest on the sand or sit on top of the ocean waves. This isn't the case with a chrysota jelly. That's a deep sea creature, too. This beautiful jellyfish is mostly ruby red, bright orange, or electric purple. That's what helped researchers realize they'd found a new species of jellyfish. The creature grows to a maximum size of 1 inch across. It has tentacles that stretch out in every direction. Now, if you come close to this jellyfish, it'll pull all these tentacles in toward its body before rapidly swimming away to avoid danger. Yes, you are dangerous. The chrysota jelly is extremely rare. You won't see it very often. You might need to borrow that deep-sea diving robot I mentioned earlier. While worms and jellyfish might seem quite harmless, this isn't the case with the Pacific viperfish. Ooh. This creature is equipped with a noticeably big mouth, like me. And the needle-like teeth inside are key to its hunting strategy. Pacific viperfish live at around 5,000 feet below the ocean surface. But they're among those numerous marine animals that migrate each night from the ocean depths toward shallower waters to dine. What's on the menu for dinner tonight? Hmm, lots of small fish and shrimp. The creature can grow up to 12 inches in length. Its two front fangs, which stick up from the fish's bottom jaw past its own eyes, are especially dramatic. When the fish unhinges its jaw, its mouth can open wide enough to engulf smaller animals. And the teeth form a cage to prevent an escape. Now, have you ever seen an underwater creature that looks like a strawberry? Trust me, it does exist. Just look at these dots on the strawberry squid. The creature has a big eye and a smaller one. You might think this unconventional pairing would be awkward and uncomfortable, but it's actually the opposite. The big left eye looks upward. It spots shadows cast by other animals in the dimly lit waters above. The eye's tubular shape helps it collect as much light as possible. On the other side of the squid's head, you can see its right eye. It's small and looks downward. This eye searches for flashes of bioluminescence produced by animals lurking in the darker waters below. 
Now, bioluminescence means the production and emission of light by living organisms. By the way, the squid has a nickname. And no, it's not squiggy, although that's a great one. It's known as the cockeyed squid. This is simply due to the remarkable difference in size between its two eyes. Hmm, I think I like squiggy better. And so it goes. Since light doesn't reach the deep sea, the strawberry squid's body actually looks black. This helps the creature hide from enemies, such as sharks and dolphins. In general, the strawberry squid grows to a length of 5 inches. It typically lives around 3,000 feet below the surface, but floats to shallower waters at night. Now, the feather star is a marine creature without a backbone, but with feather-like arms that radiate from the center of its body. These creatures first appeared around 200 million years ago. Related to sea stars, they look like a flower, but if you approach them, they'll quickly swim away. But not all feather stars can swim. Many species can only crawl along the bottom of the seafloor. Like some of the other deep-sea creatures we've looked at, the feather star can adapt to its surroundings. It has a creepy ability to shed its arms, the same way some lizards can shed their tails. This also helps them escape from their enemies. Feather stars live all across the globe, from the equator to the poles, from the shallow waters on top of reefs to the deep, deep sea. Now, given that we're dealing with mysterious creatures, the name of this one is quite fitting. The swift vampire squid should be the official symbol of life in the deep sea. The animal has a dark red body, huge blue eyes, and a cloak-like web that stretches between its eight arms. This, along with its name, may suggest that the creature is some form of a terrifying hunter. In reality, though, the vampire squid is a soft-bodied, timid creature about the size, shape, and color of a football. It grows to roughly 12 inches in length and lives 3,000 feet below the waves. There's almost no oxygen there, but also relatively few predators. Whew, I think I'll need to decompress from this one. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.